Playtesting is an important element of the game design process. Without it, many games would have mechanics that are overpowered or entire sections that simply don't function as intended, or worse, break the game entirely. But when playtesting doesn't catch an issue, developers have a few ways to fix it, the least common and sometimes most contentious of which is the ban list. So what's the purpose of a ban list, and when are they most effective? Let's talk about it today on Draw 5 Move 5. Hey everyone, and welcome to the table. My name is Gabe, and this is Draw 5 Move 5, a show where we draw connections between the mechanics behind our favorite games. Last Monday, the Yu-Gi-Oh! world was thrown into a frenzy of joy and upheaval after Konami, the company which owns and runs the game, released a new ban list. In Yu-Gi-Oh! players can play a maximum of three copies of a card in their deck. The ban list has three categories a card can fall on, limiting the number of copies one can play of a card. This breaks down into banned, zero copies per deck, limited, one copy per deck, and semi-limited, two copies per deck. It's always exciting as a Yu-Gi-Oh player when a new ban list rolls around. Cards that have been dominating the competitive scene to unfair levels can be cut back to reduce a deck's consistency, or banned altogether to stop a strategy that's unhealthy for the game. A good example of this on the most recent list is the ban of the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardish, a monster that was easy to summon and allowed you to gain up to three additional cards for no cost, while simultaneously synergizing with the Orcus deck it was played in to create an extra interruption on the opponent's turn. Meanwhile, older cards that used to be unfair can start to come off the list due to the game's constant evolution. Solemn Judgment, one of the most powerful counter traps in the game, was entirely freed on this July's update, after having been limited for the past several ban lists, and completely banned before that. These changes create a lot of good in the community, encouraging experimentation and new strategies. It also helps Konami push new product by encouraging players to try new decks either with cards that have been freed from the list, or to play new decks if their old ones don't function anymore. However, plenty of other games with competitive scenes get along just fine without ban lists. And in fact, there are some Yu-Gi-Oh players that feel we should eliminate the ban list entirely. But Yu-Gi-Oh, in my view, is a game where a ban list is right at home. To understand why, we first need to talk about playtesting. Any game or game expansion in development has playtesters. If the game is digital, these testers are trying to find glitches and hiccups in the system, making sure that the game functions as intended. In Pokemon X and Y, for example, a bug managed to slip through the cracks where the game froze if players saved their game in the overworld of Lumio City. As bad as that issue was, playtesting was done that caught many more bugs before the game was released to the public. Beyond testing for glitches and bugs, however, there are many aspects of a game that are tested to make sure they're working well. The user interfaces, or parts that allow the player to interact with the game. Things like maps, menus, and inventories for video games, cards and the play field for trading card games, and the various elements of board games such as cards, boards, and movement, all need to be tested and tuned to make sure they're understandable and easily usable for a game to function well. And finally, many games require that various elements be tested for balance. Dungeons & Dragons is a great example for this. Whenever a new class, subclass, or race for players is being introduced, it goes through a series of closed tests within Wizards of the Coast to see if the various elements are working as anticipated. Does this subclass outshine any of the others for a class, or is it too weak? And if either of these are true, how can it be amended? Does it fit the story designers are trying to tell with that class or subclass? And is it fun to play without becoming so strong that it's boring? The product is then tested within the D&D community, which can either lead back to the drawing board or to some minor tweaks before being printed in a finished product. Magic the Gathering, which is also run by Wizards of the Coast, goes through a similar process with their card designs, closed play tests followed by more open ones that help remove and tweak cards before release so that they're not so strong as to break the game. As we talked about, however, playtesting can sometimes fail to catch or fix everything before it's released to the public. The medium of game depends on how these issues can be tackled after consumers find them, and in part is why a ban list is the right answer for games like Yu-Gi-Oh! Video games in the modern day have the easiest method of correcting issues. Patches. Because many games have online options or are downloaded via the internet in the first place, it's easy for developers to release patches that fix issues after release. The X and Y bug I previously mentioned was fixed in the game's first patch, for example. 
Beyond fixing general bugs, however, many competitive online games use patches to update characters and make them more or less powerful. League of Legends does this quite often, balancing and rebalancing its champions depending on how much they're used in competitive play and how frequently they win. If one champion is consistently being used and any team that champion is on has a high win rate, the developers may take a closer look at that champion and try to rebalance it. Digital card games like Hearthstone operate much the same. The game is much like a standard trading card game, similar to Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic, but there are no physical cards. Everything is on a computer or phone. While the developers have stated that they try not to change cards very often, they have and continue to update and adjust cards for balance if they are unfun to play against or promote an unhealthy metagame. In fact, during the year that Hearthstone introduced its two formats, Standard and Wild, the game saw 21 card changes to cards in the basic and classic sets. These sets are evergreen, meaning they can be used in either format for all time. The designers tweaked these 21 cards so they wouldn't outshine the new releases. If you could build a better deck in Standard with the evergreen sets than the new ones, what would be the point of Standard's limited format? However, patches integrate seamlessly. There may be a note when the game is started that something has been updated, but beyond that the changes are simply made then take effect. Physical games like Dungeons & Dragons, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering, excluding online versions of these games such as Duel Links and Magic the Gathering Arena, have no way to seamlessly update the billions of copies of their product out in the world at once. In order to make a change to a rulebook or a card, the product would need to be rewritten and reprinted. However, the cost of reproducing them, the mistrust it would place in consumers' hands that paid for a product and now need the update, and the confusion having multiple versions of the same product running around could cause new players, prevent property owners from doing so. These games need a different, more cost-effective and less confusing option to updating their games. A suggestion to consider from Hearthstone is to introduce strategies that counter the most powerful ones. Rather than having to patch or errata older cards and game elements, new elements could be introduced to keep the old ones in check. While this can encourage the game and the players to evolve, this can also encourage power creep as we discussed when talking about the Pokemon Sword and Shield National Dex issue. Over time, this strategy can create some very dangerous feedback loops, where a game must introduce increasingly more powerful elements in order for them to maintain relevancy. This works for Hearthstone because the main competitive format, Standard, has a limited pool of cards available at a time. At the release of the year's first expansion, the three oldest sets of cards in the format, excluding the basic and classic sets, are rotated out of Standard and into Wild. In this way, the designers have more control over what cards can be played. However, Hearthstone is also very young. Magic the Gathering, despite being another card game with a rotating format, still has a ban list for its less restricted format, Modern, with 34 cards on that list. Not to mention, there is a card banned right now in Standard. The game is over 25 years old, so it should be almost expected that there would be cards designed that ended up being flawed. Yu-Gi-Oh! has this same issue, as its primary format is entirely evergreen. Every card from its over 20 year history is available for play unless it's banned. Here we see a pattern and the reason that ban lists exist. They're for successful games that cannot or will not alter their products after release, but need a way to control elements that end up being too powerful. The Pokemon video games are a good example here. Certain Pokemon are banned from competitive play, or a team is limited to only two from a pool of legendary and incredibly powerful Pokemon. For story reasons, these Pokemon were expected and designed to be overpowered, and thus are limited or banned in usage depending on the rules of the event. A patch would allow all the Pokemon to be more balanced, but that would contradict the design philosophy and intended purpose of the Pokemon. They're legendaries. They should be strong. They should be difficult to capture. The games that use ban lists have collectible elements where you can mix and match cards or creatures to create a group that may be incredibly powerful and perhaps overpowered to the point of breaking the game. The games are evergreen, having collectible elements that have spanned decades of play, and the ban lists are aimed at keeping as much of that history available for use as possible while removing any elements that prove to be troublesome later on. Almost a third of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s banned cards are from the first several years of the game. As the designers branched out, Downsides to some of these cards like Graceful Charity and Painful Choice suddenly didn't matter or became benefits, and other cards like Pot of Greed proved to be too powerful no matter what the situation. By removing these cards, the designers kept their space open so they could continue creating new and interesting cards 
without the fear of interactions with older designs before they knew better breaking the game. Playtesting can't catch everything. And when it doesn't, it's up to the designers how they want to deal with the issues that slip through the cracks. While it's not the most popular form of design fix, ban lists are still a powerful tool in a designer's kit. They have a place in evergreen games that want to last and remove the mistakes they learn from without erasing that part of the game's history. They open up the possibility of bringing elements back that were ahead of their time when the times catch up to them, and allow players to have the most options at their disposal. In some ways, it's the least limiting way that designers can put a control on the game they've created and can create a lot of excitement in the community when elements move on and off these lists. So hop on the ban list bandwagon. It's a wild ride. Thank you so much for watching. You have my humble and eternal gratitude. What did you think of the conversation? How do you feel about ban lists? And are there any games you play that could benefit from the implementation of one? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so let's keep this discussion rolling down in the comments. If you enjoyed the conversation and you want to hear more from me, hit the like button. I'm putting out new videos every week on games and gaming mechanics, so subscribe and ding-a-ling that notification bell so you never miss an update. My name is Gabe, this is Draw 5 Move 5, and until next week, go have a good game.